building the Canadian Pacific Railway, now known as CPKC, across the country was no easy task. Traveling through prairies, around lakes, and across rivers. In the early 1880s, that task became even more challenging as they reached the Canadian Rockies. Harsh winter conditions and steep grades made this build nearly impossible. One of CP Rail's biggest challenges as they moved west was the Big Hill. Trains had to deal with a grade of more than 4.5%. That often caused runaway trains, and to avoid disaster where a train would derail, CP Rail integrated runaway tracks. The original 1880s grade was located where the Trans-Canada Highway is now. Heading westbound, CP Rail added three runaway tracks shown in yellow. Each runaway track was manned 24 hours a day, and when a train was coming down that steep 4.5% grade, they would blow the whistle letting the person know that they were in control of their train. The employee would then switch the tracks so that it would be lined for the main rather than the runaway. In 1906, CP Rail decided something needed to change and they started construction on what is now called the Spiral Tunnels. In order to achieve a more desirable 2.2%, the line had to double back on itself and go through two tunnels. This train heading eastbound after entering the first spiral tunnel, it begins to climb approximately 50 feet and it will double back over itself. After gaining almost 100 feet as it passes over itself, it then begins to turn and comes past the viewing area where we are standing now.
As it continues to climb, the train then passes under the highway and then heads into the second spiral tunnel. You can currently see the train in three spots. After emerging out of the second tunnel, this train has climbed nearly 600 feet from where it was at the bottom of the valley. Heading further west, trains come down the hill into Field. Field is a very remote community and is a crew change location for trains both going east and westbound through the mountains. As trains head west of field, they continue their slow downhill trek at river grade, which is approximately half a percent. Carving their way through the Kicking Horse Valley, they pass this area along the highway. The Kicking Horse River is also a popular whitewater rafting location with class 2 and 3 rapids most of the summer. The scenery for the railway crews is absolutely spectacular. Most areas you cannot see any other way. It is hard to imagine how the survey crews back in the late 1800s managed to figure out a way through these rough and wild areas. Not only was the terrain incredibly difficult, but black bears, grizzlies, cougars, mountain goats, moose, and all other types of wild animal stood in their way. After passing through Golden, trains continue west and they arrive at Donald. In 1885, Donald was set up by CP Rail as a staging community as they were building further west. Many people moved into this location to help with building the railway. You can still see the roads that were in this community. And if you look closely, when you're on those roads, there are still foundations left in place from the homes after CP Rail abandoned this area and moved to what is now called Revelstoke. For more than 20 years, people lived in this community. And if you know where to look, there is a graveyard as well, with headstones dating back to those days.
continuing west, trains pass through what is known as Redgrave. This area was very difficult to build through, and the track alignment has actually been changed three times through this area. went around the outside of this mountainside. The second line went through this tunnel in 1910 and the third is what you see the train on now. You can still see some of the original grade here very clearly, prior to them tunneling through the mountainside. Moving further west, we get to Beaver, or what is now called Beavermouth, and Kinbasket Lake. Prior to the Mica Dam being built, the highway and the railway ran through what is now the lake bed. Even after 50 years, you can still see the remnants of the rail bed in the lake bottom. The town of Beaver was also the very first pusher station where they put extra locomotives on the trains as they head west. There was a railway station and even a Y that you can just barely make out on the far left of the screen. Moving past the most northern point on the CPKC main line, trains now head south towards Rogers and what was known as the Rogers Pusher Station.
after Ken Basket Lake was created by the Mica Dam, the pusher station at Beaver had to be moved to Rogers. So from the mid-1960s to the mid-1980s, this was the pusher station taking trains up to Glacier from Rogers. The grade was a very difficult 2.5% or greater and took trains more than an hour to climb. Where the train is passing now, there used to be a Y. That Y was used to turn the diesel locomotives and before that the steam locomotives around. Trains would be split into two at this location and then the extra power would be inserted into the middle. That train with the extra power would then get assisted up to the top of the steep grade at Glacier where that power would then be removed and the train would then continue on. After being removed, the pushers would then return back down to the bottom at Rogers to start the cycle all over again on the next train. The pusher station had three crew on rotation and they lived on site. They had a bunkhouse with a chef and laundry facilities. You got to know your crewmates really well in this remote location. In the early 1980s, CP decided that they needed to improve the rail traffic through this area and build a much more manageable 1% grade. That new grade included two new tunnels, the Shaughnessy and the Mount McDonald. Once completed in the late 1980s, trains just continued on up the McDonald grade and did not need the pusher station anymore. So that area, including the Y, was abandoned. The intermodal that you see coming around the bend in the distance is coming down the original Connaught grade. With the exception of an eastbound mixed manifest that runs daily, most heavy tonnage trains are heading westbound, so using the new 1% grade is much easier for them. All five units will be in full dynamics with a little bit of air added to the train to help with braking, Keeping a 12,000 foot train under control on a hill like this takes skill. At time of filming it was mid-April and as you can see there's still lots of snow in the mountains. There you go. <laughs> Some of the amenities inside the cab of the train for the crew include a fridge and a hot plate and in some cases, such as the CN unit, they even have a microwave. Train crews can spend between 6 and 10 hours inside the locomotive cab for one trip going one direction.
The original grade, built in the early 1880s, had many bridges. Some were made of wood and others were made of steel and even stone. The most famous of all bridges is Stony Creek Bridge, shown here, built in 1893. It replaced the original bridge that lasted less than 10 years. The location where I am standing now is the exact location where world-famous Nicholas Morant once stood. Nicholas Morant took many photos of trains going over this bridge and also did a lot of photographs for National Geographic. The bridge stands 270 feet high and 486 feet long and has a 336 foot steel arch span. In 1929, two additional truss arches, one on each side, were added to strengthen the bridge and the deck was reinforced and remains to this day one of the highest railway bridges in North America at over 3,500 feet above sea level. The original rail line that ran between Stony Creek and Glacier did not have any tunnels and the elevation was higher than what it currently is. There is very little evidence of that line left other than this stone bridge that you can see here. Even with several snow sheds, that line was treacherous in the winter time in particular for trains to travel on. So CP finally built a tunnel known as the Connaught Tunnel. That tunnel is five miles long and opened in 1916. Construction on that tunnel started at both ends and when they met, they were less than a foot off. That tunnel is also ruler straight. On a sunny day, you can actually see the pin of light at the other end It's hard to imagine, but this tunnel used to have two tracks going through it. And trains would often travel in both directions at the same time. With trains getting longer and larger, they eventually reduced that to one track. And then in the 1980s, they also lowered the floor to gain some more height in the tunnel to accommodate the double stack tall intermodal trains. Glacier, located at the west end of the Connaught Tunnel, is also the highest point on the Canadian Pacific Railway at 3,750 feet above sea level. When the railways first came through this area in the late 1800s, it became a very popular area to stop. They eventually built a railway station in this location called Glacier Station. But when the highway came through here and people started to transition over to driving, the popularity of taking passenger trains and stopping in these areas became less and less. And the station was eventually abandoned and sat derelict for many years. In 2022, it was taken down and is going to be rebuilt in Banff. 
as part of a revitalization of the Bounce Station area. When building the new grade up Rogers Pass in the 1980s, known as the McDonald Grade, two tunnels had to be built as well. The Mount Shaughnessy Tunnel, seen here, and the Mount McDonald. This tunnel is just over a mile long. This tunnel did not originally have any fans in it because builders didn't think that it would be required. However, trains were working very hard up this grade and by the time they reached this tunnel, they were very hot to begin with and with no fans, locomotives were actually overheating and shutting down. Fans were added in the early 1990s. This train approaching now is a loaded grain and it is working very hard climbing this 1% grade. This loaded grain train is nearly 10,000 feet long and weighs more than 22,000 tons. After passing through the Shaughnessy Tunnel, trains approach the McDonald Tunnel East Portal. While continuing their climb up this grade, they have now passed the halfway point. At more than nine miles long, the McDonald Tunnel is the longest railway tunnel in North America. This new grade is more than 300 feet below the Connaught grade, and this tunnel actually crosses directly under it. The McDonald Tunnel goes through two entire mountains. The McDonald Tunnel was the first railway tunnel ever built in North America using modern day technology such as GPS and a tunnel boring machine. The tunnel took four years to build. Because this tunnel was so long, engineers decided to also use the traditional way of blasting coming from the other end. So the two methods, a tunnel boring machine and blasting, were used and they met in the middle. That tunnel boring machine was never removed after construction. It is still in the middle of the tunnel, as it would have cost too much and too much effort to remove. A long tunnel such as this also required a whole new different design for moving air through it. The ventilation building is located near the midpoint of the tunnel and sits over 1,200 feet above the tunnel floor. 
That is equivalent to a 160 story tall building. The fan shaft even includes an elevator. There are four 2,250 horsepower fans, two exhaust fans, and two supply. As the train first starts moving through the tunnel, the fans are on a low speed setting. Once the train completely enters the tunnel, there is a large steel door that closes in behind it. Once the door has closed, the fans will ramp up to full speed. At that point, the wind in the tunnel is equivalent to hurricane force at more than 70 miles an hour. Something of note as well, when trains with loaded auto racks go through this tunnel, RTC is informed and they run the fans at a lower speed in order to avoid literally sandblasting the vehicles inside the auto racks. Another unique design of this tunnel is that it is completely lined from one end to the other in concrete and has lighting throughout. After the tail end of the train passes the midpoint, there is another large steel door that closes behind it to help move air through more efficiently. It will take a train more than 45 minutes to pass through the tunnel completely. Here we catch an eastbound as it goes up the original Connaught grade and a westbound as it comes out of the west portal of the McDonnell Tunnel. This location is the tipping point for westbound trains as they now begin to head downhill towards Revelstoke. The sheer scale of the mountains and the size of the relatively small exit on the tunnel really is mind-boggling when you see this image. From Revelstoke to Glacier, trains gain an elevation of more than 2,200 feet, over 45 miles. The trackage is very difficult in some areas, meaning trains need to travel through many tunnels and snowsheds along the way. In the winter months annually, this area can get as much as 40 feet of snow 
And when that snow lets go on the mountainside, it can cause a lot of damage, so these sheds help protect the trains and the infrastructure. As mentioned earlier, for the first few decades, CP Rail redirected where trains traveled through difficult areas, such as this location known as Downey. Many bridges were built of wood originally and did not hold up well against the elements, particularly in the wintertime. So CP Rail brought over some stone masons directly from Italy to help them build some stone bridges. In the 1930s, CP abandoned this line and moved it over in order to avoid some very dangerous areas where many slides continuously happened year after year. Although that Stone Arch Bridge does not see any rail traffic over it anymore, it is still used as an access road for maintenance vehicles. Moving further west, we have Albert Canyon, a very well-known location because it was a passenger stop for many tourists during the early 1900s due to the terrific views and, of course, the hot springs that are still here today. You can still see part of the original Y that was in this location that was used to turn locomotives around.
From 1885 to about 1950, this area was also the location of a pusher station to push trains up towards Glacier. This, of course, was also before the diesel locomotive was introduced, so everything was still powered by steam. Nearing Revelstoke, this train has now been traveling downhill non-stop for more than two hours. The incredible journey of Canadian Pacific trains through the mountains cannot go unnoticed. Bringing goods across the country at one time was once thought as an impossible task. With some train lengths reaching nearly 14,000 feet long and some weighing more than 26,000 tons, it is an incredible journey. With Canadian Pacific Kansas City entering a new era, it will be very interesting to follow with trains traveling all the way down to Mexico. I originally thought of only making this available on Blu-ray, but I decided against that, so please take a moment and donate to the cost of making this as this took a very long time to put together. Use the thanks button below.